Uh, welcome to everybody who's here uh, to the first episode of DSSA's um, webinar series. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Natalie. Um, I'm one of the VPs for education on the national team and I'll be moderating the event tonight. Um, I wanna give a special shout out to my fellow co-VP for education, um, Alexander Hernandez, who is logged on today. I think her camera maybe isn't working, but she's here. Um, and also, the there you are. <laughs> Hi, you're welcome. And then also Hannah Weiss, who's one of our VPs for advocacy. Um, both of them have been so integral to creating this project and, and getting it started. So, um, and Hannah unfortunately couldn't be here um, today. So just as a quick introduction to everybody who's new, um, our goal in behind spearheading the initiative was not only to create a, um, a platform for us to engage and continue to discuss and learn from one another and from our distinguished faculty mentors, but also um, to increase access to global surgery lecture series that could span across geographic areas and not just be available to individuals at a local institution. So to that end, um, this webinar and all future webinars um, in the DSSA series will be recorded and then posted on the DSSA website um, so they can be accessible to those who couldn't be in attendance. Um, to everyone that is here, again, welcome. Thank you for taking the time. And just a few quick announcements. So right now, um, automatically when you uh, join the meeting, all audience members' um, mics should be muted and we just ask that you continue to keep your mics muted um, throughout the event. We wanted to provide everybody an opportunity to um, engage with our panelists during the Q&A session. And um, some of you have already submitted some really wonderful questions. Um, and, and I thank you for that. And if any other questions pop up, hopefully they do, throughout the event, um, I ask that you uh, submit them using the chat feature on Zoom. So if you go to the bottom of your screen on the Zoom screen um, and there's a chat and you write in your uh, question, they will send it directly to me. Um, and then I can relay um, I can relay the questions to our panelists at the end of the, as many as I can at the Q and A session. Um, okay, and so I think that's pretty much it for the logistical stuff. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, so Dr. Davis from um, Baylor College of Medicine in, in Texas, and Dr. Price from University of Utah in Intermountain Care. Um, so Dr. Davis has made huge strides um, in attempting to address all of the gaps in, in general surgical education here in the U.S. for individuals who are interested in planning on, on practicing in resource poor settings. Um, for example, she led, um, she created and led the development of the um, Baylor College of Medicine Global Surgery Track, and since 2014, she has continued to work with the Baylor Department of Surgery. Um, to develop educational opportunities um, in global surgery, including collaborating with the National School of Tropical Medicine and Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology to create a diploma course in tropical surgery, obstetrics, and gynecology. Um, she had previously completed her um, MD at Baylor and also uh, finished a dedicated two-year global sur surgery fellowship training, and she's currently in her fourth year of her general surgery uh, residency. So. Seems like you really like Baylor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a good place. Um, she has operated in Ecuador, uh, Guatemala, Malawi, Mongolia, Nepal, Tanzania, um, and she has worked with Dr. Walt Johnson in the um, area of emergency and essential surgery at the World Health Organization. And just very quickly, I'll also introduce um, Dr. Price. So Dr. Price, um, co-founded and serves as the director for the Center of Global Surgery at the University of Utah, and he directs the um, graduate surgical education at Intermountain Medical Center. Um, he received his MD from Harvard Medical School and completed his surgical re residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, he is a clinical professor uh, in the Department of Surgery and an adjunct associate professor in the Department for um, Family and Preventative Medicine at the University of Utah. Um, he's participated in over, uh, participated in or led over 40 medical and surgical expeditions throughout the world, um, has authored numerous peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and books, including um, the seminal book, Global Surgery and Public Health, A New Paradigm. He serves or has served in many leadership positions with the World Health Organization Initiative for Emergency and Essential Surgical Care, 
um, the American College of Surgeons, the Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons, and the International Surgical Society. So thank you so much to both of you for being here. Uh, we're really excited, like I said, to listen to your narratives, and um, I'll, I'll let you, Dr. Davis, take us away. Maybe you can, you can start first. You can provide the perspective of someone that's more in the, uh, you know, like early stages and, and of a blossoming career. <laughs> um, well, thank you guys so much for having me. It's, um, it's really fun to get to see you all and see all your faces um, and get to feel like I'm with you everywhere that you guys are. And, um, and hopefully my experiences will uh, kind of encourage you all as, as training can seem like it goes on for a very long time as it kind of does, I'm, um, as you said, I'm in my fourth year of general surgery residency, and then I did two years of global surgery. So I'm in my sixth PGY year, um, or postgraduate year. And so it, it, it does seem to take a while, but, um, but I think that you're all clearly very dedicated, so you can do it. Um, so I was trying to think through my story as this is kind of a narrative about our, our global surgery backgrounds. And um, I think uh, though it was a while ago, I think I have to start in high school. Um, so when I was a ninth grader, I decided I wanted to go into medicine because I was in geography class. And though I have really contemplated it, I cannot figure out why we were watching this video in geography class. But for some reason, we were watching something um, that involved um, medical care uh, for women and they, they were looking at a small community where um, there was a problem with malnutrition and a lot of the women um, were because of some growth stunting were having a lot of difficulty with obstructed labor and um, and the women commented that um, that even though they what they really needed was c-sections um, they weren't able to go to the doctors because even though they had doctors there um, the doctors were all men and it was considered um, sort of improper for a woman to go see a male doctor and um, and yet at the same time in that particular community the women were also not really allowed to go to medical school so uh, it was a, a bit of a catch-22 and so I remember thinking um, this is not the most complex uh, logic at the time, but I thought, oh, well, they need doctors. I can be a doctor and I'm also a woman. So that seems like that could be very useful. So that, that was really my primary motivation for, um, for pursuing medicine, um, but not specific to surgery or OBGYN at that time. Um, and then when I went into medical school, I started noticing that most of the things that I would consider to be useful at that time were primarily centered um, around infectious diseases and OB-GYN. And so um, I kept kind of trying to convince myself that I wanted to do those things, um, but I really, my heart really wasn't in it. And, um, and so it came down to, uh, I had, I think a spread of uh, five specialties that I worked down to ob -GYN versus general surgery. And, um, and I made, as I had told Parissa this recently, I made a, a very extensive pro-con list and, um, and OB-GYN won. And as you can see, that's why I'm an OB-GYN. Um, that's a joke because I'm not. Um, so <laughs> what happened was I got to the end and OB-GYN should have won based on the points, but I was really disappointed. So, um, so I took that as a sign that really um, my passion was for general surgery. So um, I decided to pursue general surgery. And um, when I was applying, I knew that I wanted to do international work and work in um, low resource settings where there, there were not a, a many other surgeons in the area. Um, but I couldn't find any particular training for that kind of thing. Um, so I had been referred to rural surgery training, uh, which I thought might provide a bit more broad um, training for what I was looking for. And so as I was interviewing, I interviewed at some rural programs and I thought it was um, really intriguing that they would be more prepared at the end of their training to go um, and do uh, things that maybe in larger academic medical centers were not as important components of general surgery practice. Um, but in talking to a number of, of people, um, even those skills that were trained in rural surgery programs were not necessarily complete for what you would need in a low resource setting. 
And so, um, so what I really wanted was a training that didn't exist at that time. And so I kind of just resigned myself to thinking that, um, that I probably wouldn't have the opportunity to do that. And, um, and so maybe I could, if I was lucky, pick up skills along the way um, that might make me um, more useful in a setting like that. And so um, when I was putting my match list, I, I sort of thought, well, I am going to have to make a sacrifice because there's not a program in existence that is what I, that is specific to global surgery. Um, and so when I was lucky enough to match at Baylor, um, my, the beginning of my intern year, I had two years of research and I um, essentially spoke with the program director and, um, and the chair and um, mentioned that I, I really wanted to pursue the creation of um, a global surgery track. And, um, and my program director suggested that I bring it up at our education committee, which is um, a big meeting of all the, um, uh, not all, but a, a bunch of faculty members in our department. And, um, and so I had never been to one of these. I was an intern and I was uh, pretty nervous about this. And um, I prepared this big presentation and then I got there and it turns out it was completely inappropriate for the kind of meeting that it was. And then of course the PowerPoint didn't work and lots of other things happened. And, um, and so I ended up giving, basically pitching it cold um, with just a, a handout. And my chair uh, immediately said, um, yes, this sounds like something that we should pursue. Um, why don't you get together a faculty committee and figure out how this would work functionally? So we created a, um, a faculty uh, group and sort of workshopped the idea a little bit and toyed with it and, um, and then brought it back and it was essentially approved. And then, for the next two years of my residency training, we sort of fine tuned it and got buy-in from another, a bunch of other departments and um, petitioned a um, residency committee to approve the process. Um, and so went about creating this program. And so the foundations of the program were based on, um, this was 2014, so this was essentially um, this was before we had a lot of really great data, so we didn't have the essential surgeries and we didn't have um, the Lancet Commission um, report printed quite yet. And, um, and so what we did at that time was just uh, interview a whole bunch of people who were doing what I wanted to do and practicing in low research settings. And um, basically just compiled this really long list of all the things that they wish that they knew how to do. And then categorized those and um, and sorted them into specialty. And I started noticing that there was a, uh, there were sort of compartments. So some recurrent themes were OB-GYN. There were um, obviously a lot of OB-GYN procedures that they wished that they knew how to do, but they couldn't. Um, there were a lot of urology procedures, burns, um, which some programs have in general surgery, but, um, but is kind of being phased out of a lot of general surgery training programs. And, um, Orthopedics obviously was a really important part. And so, uh, so I categorized them into topics and, uh, and created a schedule that included specialty care. Um, so ortho, ob urology, burns. Um, mine had ENT as well. Um, there were some things in the initial plan that ended up uh, getting kind of shaken out as I had to tighten it up a bit. So I had initially wanted to do um, family practice and anesthesia but there wasn't really time for that. And, um, and then also we thought research was really important. Uh, so we had a research component and of course international work because even if you're training to do um, certain things in the US, like maybe you've done a million um, laparoscopic appendectomies, but you haven't done any open appendectomies, then um, you might not have the experience needed to do um, surgeries in particular regions. Um, so it included uh, some international time as well and also ended up incorporating some time to the WHO. Um, but all of that sort of evolved with time. So I didn't know that I was going to spend time at the WHO until I ended up meeting um, Dr. Johnson. And, um, and so I think a lot of that taught me flexibility 
and um, and also I just had a sort of evolving realization of the things that I thought were important. And um, and then along with that, there were um, didactic components. So every week we meet and have um, talks on on various topics. So as we began to create it, um, we started getting funding. We started getting more support. And, um, and we actually uh, decided as a department that we would take one person every year and set, it, set that person aside and actually dedicate them to global surgery. So now we have one person every year and, um, and we've been including one more person every year for the past five years. So now we have actually a team of five people which is kind of nice because we're not all this, we're staggered. So, um, so each of us is essentially we're apart. And so, um, oh, hi. <laughs> um, so uh, it's nice that we're all at different stages of our um, education, but there's a longitudinal component to it. So, um, so all have been in the program for seven years, um, but Megan, the person who's the fellow after me, um, obviously started um, residency after me. So um, she and then Yumna and Sakriti and then David, we all are at, at various phases, but we're all together with each other um, for many years of our training, which is really nice. So, um, so now we actually have a match number and, um, and people can apply essentially to be a global surgeon and to have global surgery training, which um, I am not, please, please tell me if I'm wrong, um, but I'm not aware of any other program that you can match into global surgery in a, a longitudinal program through the NRMP, um, which is really, really cool um, because I think that as evidenced by all the student interest in GSSA that um, so many of us want to be involved in low resource settings. Um, but what we would hate to do is to be unprepared to do that or to do it poorly. And so um, just like so many people train um, to be vascular surgeons or to be um, pediatric surgeons, I think it's really important that we train to be really excellent at global surgery, if that's our goal. Um, because there are so many skills that are really particular to this kind of work and that it's, it's not just, oh, can you do a C-section, but it's also, um, do you, do you understand, um, a lot of the, the cultural ramifications or this, you know, working with governments or how do you, um, set up a, a triage center or how do you address national, natural disasters or, uh, there are just so many components to it, um, that are outside of traditional general surgical training that I think you really, um, you really need dedicated time for it to be, uh, really good at it. And so I think all of us um, have spent a lot of time on it and a lot of time developing the program now. And, um, and we still are constantly kind of refining it. And um, I don't think global surgery is just one thing. It's, I think the cool thing about it is that um, for the five of us in the program, so like I was saying, it's stair-stepped. Um, so there are five of us right now, but we're adding one more every year to a maximum of seven. So we'll have seven total concurrently, which will be really nice. And, um, and we also split the training years to have one year after um, the second global surgery year and one, or sorry, one, one year after the second general surgery year and one year after the chief year. So that um, when you're, a, you know, you're done with your second year, you have different skill sets and you can maybe do less um, complex surgical um, things. So maybe you're ready to do a C-section, but you're not quite ready to do a complex fistula repair. Um, you can do that at a level that's appropriate for your training. And I also think it's nice to have the rep repetition because um, if you just do it all in one block, I think it's really easy in three years when you graduate from general surgery, you know, how do I, how do I set an open fracture? I can't remember. Um, so it's nice to have that repetition um, throughout your training. Um, to really solidify that. So, um, yeah, I, I think we're still developing it and we're still um, really refining it. But I think the main takeaway is that um, for all of you trainees, that there wasn't 
something that was in existence at that time. Oh, I guess I should also kind of mention the, um, the tropical surgery obstetrics and gynecology course, which is that um, a lot of people don't necessarily have access to something like this. And um, so for practicing surgeons who really want to transition their, um, their practice or people who just want to supplement their education but um, don't have access to a multi-year fellowship, um, it's, there's just a, a diploma course that we've created through the National School of Tropical Medicine. And the next one will be next August. So the last week of August, 2020. And, um, and you're all welcome to participate in that. Um, but I think just looking back at our program, it's changed so much in the past five years. And so what I want to encourage all of you guys to do is, um, I think one of the hardest things to do is to figure out who you want to be as a surgeon. Um, and so I would really, just like you would spend time thinking about your specialty um, or what you want to apply to, I just really encourage you all to spend time thinking about your practice setting and, um, and what you really want to contribute um, with your career. And so if you think that you really want to work, um, I don't know, in, in whatever uh, region or whatever specialty, just think about components that are important to that and try to tailor your education to that. Because um, I think in some ways we think about education as just something to complete. And so like college, it's just, um, we need to finish our degree and, and be done with it. But really in surgery, your education is what's gonna make people safe, what's gonna help your patients. And um, what's, I, I think it's more important than just completing a degree. So. Um, so you have to advocate for your own education, advocate for, um, for your training. So I just want to encourage you guys um, that even if something isn't necessarily there at your institutions, it, it doesn't mean that it can't be, and it doesn't mean that you can't shape your education to be um, what you need to make you the most successful and um, the most effective uh, global surgeon. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. That was, um, that was a fantastic message, a really motivational uh, message to end on. And you certainly are proof that, uh, that it can be done. Um, and I loved, I loved your point about being humble and acknowledging the limitations of our own experiences, just in a general training and acknowledging that training to become a global surgeon is not the same as training to become another kind of surgeon and really creating the opportunities to, to, to be the best kind of surgeon that we want to be. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. All right. So now, um, Dr. Price, um, if you, Dr. Price can share his story and his, his journey into global surgery and some of the things that he has done. That's great. There's wonderful comments there, Rachel. Love, uh, love seeing that program grow and all the great work you've done there. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Um, so the, the, the um, Starting off, first off, everybody asks me, what, what do I need to do to be, a, uh, be involved in global surgery? And the best answer I usually give is get well trained in something. Uh, so often I see people trying to say, I want to do global surgery and you know, pick out and say, I'm going to do some little thing here in some country. And they forget to get well trained because what people need are people well trained. And I think Rachel outlined a really good plan for people to get a very good broad training. Um, but just as a, a, a comment that there's, there's need for people who are, have experience in many areas. Some, I have a lot of people come, oh, I just can't do this global surgery. I'm a transplant surgeon. Well, guess what? Mongolia needed to send a liver transplant. They've now done 80 liver transplants because the Koreans helped them. Um, there are people who say, I, I'm a radiologist. Oh my gosh, I can't do international medicine, there are people all around the world that need, for us to be able to do good surgery, we need good radiologists. Um, and so my path was uh, one where I, I wondered many times, should I really do this in general surgery? Do I need to be a plastic surgeon so I could do cleft lips? Or do I need to be an ophthalmologist to, to really do global surgery? And, and because it wasn't really quite there in general surgery, it was kind of creating a new pathway. My, uh, my interest began a long time ago. I grew up as an Air Force brat moving around the world. My dad was a trauma surgeon, 
Uh, I used to pull out his medical books and draw the pictures in them and label the different parts of the skull and whatever else was in there. I was just kind of a nerd. So, and then we moved to Salt Lake. Dad got out of the Air Force. He set up the trauma system here in Salt Lake City. So I watched the life flight develop, the seventh air ambulance system in the country. And whenever we went on a family vacation, we always were the first at the scene of some bad accident. And my dad always knew what to do. He always jumped up, jumped out to begin to help, assigned us to do different things. And I really thought that I want to know uh, someday how to help take care of people in that situation. Um, my love for the developing world really came as I was uh, called to be a, a missionary for our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the Mormons. And I spent two years in Thailand from 1978 to 1980. And I was assigned to help for seven months uh, teach the first person in the northeast of Thailand to be the leader of our church group there. So I got to go out and work in their homes. And when they got kicked out of their homes to get the, the small little branch together to go and cut down the bamboo and make them a, a two-room house for six children and two parents uh, out of bamboo or, you know, the, the, the chicken farm is washing away in the floods and we have to go dig ditches around the chicken farm. And, that may not sound like global surgery, but it allowed me to understand how people live and, and what's needed. And I found the medical situation in those areas was quite poor. Um, saw things where, you know, if you had got a big bite, I learned a lot of cool things, how you hold the foot that has the bite on it over boiling water with a boiling, uh, you know, they boil a frog in there. Now how that worked, I don't know, but it seemed to work. And so it opened up my eyes actually to, different ways to do things that I had never thought of. When I came back uh, from my mission, the Queen of Thailand came to the United States, and when she was in Salt Lake City, I was asked to be on the translating committee for her entourage. And when I was an undergrad, I essentially made a commitment that I wanted to go to medical school and go back to Thailand and help her people. Um, when I came home from Thailand, there was a lot of refugees coming from Southeast Asia, and I spent 20 to 30 hours a week in undergrad, volunteering and translating, resettling, teaching English uh, with the Laotian, Vietnamese, and Cambodian refugees. And again, to hear their stories, and, uh, and even here in the States, the lack of care that they had was just uh, unbelievable. Um, in Boston, when I was in medical school, similarly, worked with very underprivileged groups. And so the point here is that global surgery, it really is around the world. You don't have to leave the country. You don't have to leave your backyard. There is so much to be done here and to understand the cultural challenges people have accessing surgical care and health care in our own environments. Then residency started at the Brigham and my life ended and I just lived at the Brigham. <laughs> uh, anybody who's been through that understands there's every other night, so I don't want to hear any whining about every third or every fourth night call. Uh, but when I finished during my residency, I had a child, uh, we had six children. My first son actually died a sudden infant death. My first child six months later became severely handicapped because of a severe viral encephalitis. The fellowships that I was uh, accepted to, I was offered various fellowships to finish, and, but my daughter was in and out of the hospital so much, we decided we needed to move back to Salt Lake City uh, where family was and to, to help out. We thought we might eventually someday go out and do a fellowship, but. That just never materialized. But it did allow me to begin to look at some of this international work. When I was at Harvard Medical School, I took some classes in public health, and somebody heard that I wanted to go into surgery. They came up, one of the professors, and said, don't you know surgery is not part of public health? So I never got my master's of public health. Um, and it wasn't until 2000 when it was actually my wife came to me and said, hey, her Sister and brother-in-law were taking three of their kids to do a trip to Indonesia to build a school and run a medical clinic. And this has been one of our goals, so we wanted our kids to experience this. So we went and did uh, one of the most adventurous trips we've ever done. And, uh, and it was there working in this small little village where this young boy comes in with a massive spleen, whether or not it's a lymphoma or if it's malaria that just was poorly treated needed to have a splenectomy because he couldn't breathe. And we took him down to a local hospital eight hours away. There's no surgeon. There's only a surgeon there two, two months out of the year. Access for surgical care wasn't there. And the amount of surgical diseases that were presenting themselves was 
phenomenal. It's like it wasn't that it wasn't necessary, just nobody was addressing it. And it became obvious the impact that these surgical diseases had on the economy of, these, of this community, um, more people having to take care of them. Um, it was a huge public health issue. And so uh, we began to work with various NGOs and became uh, the medical director of various NGOs, trying to do medical work and surgical work, and found that a lot of the groups we were working with, I wasn't quite happy about the way the medical care was to the point that at one time we invited the directors of the various countries in this one NGO to the United States. And one of the questions I asked them was, how is the medical care we're providing different from what you have? And they all hung their heads and said, well, it's about the same, if not worse. You're diagnosing things without any diagnostic capability. You're providing medicines and not knowing what you're treating. Uh, if you're doing surgery, you're not really linked into the system. And so how you do surgical care that links into the system became a real concern for me. And um, we began to work with various NGOs to improve their medical and surgical uh, experience. And it was actually a patient of mine that gave me the real opportunity to see surgery. He came in, he was running a foundation in, in Ogden and was running it over in uh, Ogden, Utah and was working in Mongolia. There was a foundation that had decided that they weren't doing anything by helping mo many countries. They felt like they weren't, nothing sustainable. And they said, Could, we're, we're donating, we've chosen one country to see if we can make a difference. They were donating medical equipment to 39 different hospitals, but they didn't know how to use it. Could you provide training to figure out how to do that? So I went there only because they said they'd be in Mongolia one more year and then they'd be in Cambodia. That would get me much closer to Thailand. Um, they have never gone to Cambodia and I'm 16 years later still in Mongolia. So being adaptable like, <laughs> like was mentioned is very important and being flexible because when I first went to Mongolia, they wanted training in trauma. I was on the National Committee on Trauma. Uh, we had been writing uh, the third and fourth editions of the Rural Trauma Team Development Course, and we wrote that to try to be available for more rural areas of the world. And uh, so when I went there, they said, no, uh, I was asked to come to the university hospital. Can you teach laparoscopy? Now, this is where I thought this was the stupidest thing I ever heard, trying to teach laparoscopy when I saw what they didn't have. But then they told me this story of a gallbladder disease being so rampant, it was the second most common cause of inpatient morbidity. Um, and essentially the chief of surgery there said, we demand to have laparoscopic surgery for our people. We need it more than you do in your country. It is a, a, an impact on our economy. People can't afford to be sick. We're having higher complication rates. And only 2% of the gallbladders are being done that way. And we began process of trying to figure out what a model was to teach laparoscopy there and and went out to ask various companies to help support us. We eventually got Mrs. Storch that donated millions of dollars of equipment as we shipped over there. Um, and we, we began to set up laparoscopy and when she asked us to take it to the countryside for the first time, I presented it at a meeting and somebody said, you're just teaching people enough to be dangerous, to cause more complications. You're a bad doctor. And I thought, well, maybe you're right. I don't know. I haven't studied it. And I was director of the residency program, and I had residents asking for projects. Um, and so we studied, after we started laparoscopy in one of the small cities, and we compared the outcomes to that city to the five places in the capital that had been doing it for 10 years. And we found the outcome was no different. It was when we really started to bring in the academic component into what we were doing. Uh, and then being able to use that academic component to further have impact. And so that it wasn't just about getting a paper or getting an article, it's how is this gonna be used to move things further? So showing that our model was uh, safe, allowed us to go ahead and do a, a, a project throughout the entire country, then to study that and report on the countrywide expansion was picked up and we used that in the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery where we now make the recommendation countries should increase their surgical output by 8.9% 8 .8 based on the paper that we published. It, it leads to the, recommend, or the, the statement that really surgery should be cost effective. Um, and so how do we use, um, we, you know, taking the, our 
data to the Ministry of Health. It's helped provide more funding to be able to do the, the projects there. Um, so Mongolia has been a good thing for laparoscopy, uh, the Advanced Trauma Life Support course. Uh, actually, we took the basic uh, life support course there and started it, OBGYN, surgical uh, uh, orthopedic spine surgery, so many different projects. Um, during this, we thought, well, this academic stuff is really kind of important. And I'm a, I was a private practice clinician but I run the residency program for the residency at Intermountain Healthcare. And so we went, I went to the chief of surgery at the University of Utah and said, maybe we should start an academic center for global surgery. And he said, go talk to Catherine DeVries. She does that touchy feely stuff too. It's actually pretty wise. Catherine DeVries is a pediatric urologist who set up international volunteers in urology. We got to be very good friends and we started a, a program at her home, invited anybody interested in, this global surgery work to figure out how we go forward. And she, uh, at that point, we thought, what does it mean to be an academic center? We started a course called Global Surgery and Public Health. From that, we wrote our first book. Um, we started, a, we did a course for the American College of Surgeons here in Utah, uh, but we took a lot of people and we started having lots of peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, books, that we went back to the chief of surgery and says, now this is what we're talking about. We're talking about how you use academics that can impact, uh, that can look at problems, study them, find solutions, implement things, and then from those implementations, even take things further. At that point, they funded a Center for Global Surgery in 2011 uh, that's been funded ever since uh, for a director, part-time, supposed to be one day a week. It's turned out to be another full-time volunteer job. Um, uh, one fellow, we have a fellow that's different than the fellowship that Rachel uh, uh, described. It's more of a, a research kind of, uh, re uh, rather than a clinical fellowship. Um, we have a program manager. We just had the department of OBGYN join us uh, fully. So we now have a now program coordinator for OBGYN. Uh, we have projects in Ghana, uh, in uh, developing one in Rwanda. We have them in Nepal and Vietnam and Mongolia. Uh, we represent all of the divisions within the department. We have cardiac surgery that we've helped uh, go over to Mongolia. Uh, the emergency medicine group is uh, working on developing a residency program in Vietnam. Plastic surgery is developing a uh, one-year uh, uh, kind of fellowship for general surgeons in, in Ghana to, to learn plastic surgery techniques. Um, so it's trying to figure out how we can use academics to to, to go further. So anyway, that's a little bit how I got started and, and where we're at right now. All right, thank you so much. Um, I mean, thank you so much for all of the work truly that you've done because with, with through your use of academics, with all the book chapters and peer reviewed articles, it kind of lays the foundation and there's still so much work to be done, but it's, it's, an, it's a great point to, to keep the focus of like, what can you do that's sustainable and an intervention to, to act and then to utilize academics to see how it's working and how it can be adapted. Um, I could listen to you both for hours. I, you know, 15 minutes, 15 minutes seems so short, but luckily now we're gonna move on to the Q&A portion. Um, so I did have a few questions that some audience members um, sent in. I'll start with um, one, this question is for the both of you. Um, leaders are often seen as capable and strong people who can handle all the problems thrown at them. What are some vulnerable moments that you are willing to share that transformed you um, and, and led to your success? Whoever wants to answer first. You have a good answer, Rachel? Um, sure. <laughs> Had lots of vulnerable moments. Um, <laughs> I think uh, how this one goes to all you people, um, goes out to y'all who are matching. Um, so when I was um, making my match list, I actually, I put Baylor, Baylor had two match um, numbers. So there was one that was research and it was a seven year program. And there was one that was non-research, it was clinical purely, and it was a five-year program. And, um, and so I really wanted to go to Baylor. Um, so I ranked both of them at the top of my list. And, but 
I had in my mind thought, well, there's this chance that I might be able to use those research years as um, global surgery years, but that seemed really, really unlikely. So I actually chickened out and I put the five-year program first and the seven-year program second. And so when I matched into the seven-year program, I thought, well, now I really have to do it. <laughs> so, um, so that was, I think, the instance of you don't always, what you want is not always what's best for you. Um, because if I had gotten what I wanted, which was sort of the cop-out choice um, to do the thing that, um, that was less risky for me, which was um, just do the five-year program and then not, um, not try to figure out the global surgery training, then I wouldn't have been in a position to do it. And so, um, so I think that's a situation where you don't always know what's best and sometimes things work out in a way that ends up being best for you, um, but it might not be what you were, you know, feeling like you were ready for. So, um, so that's, I guess, my vulnerable story. So, um, we, we should have a whole conference on, uh, that's sim simply this con um, concept, not all the good things that there are the successes. It's like Facebook, you know, what goes on Facebook? It's always the good things. You know, you think everybody else is perfect and doing everything well, and you don't see all the challenges. <laughs> um, and I think there are probably much more challenges than there are successes or failures than there are successes. Um, and just even from within your home institution to trying to get the projects going in the various places. Um, I can't count the number of times people say you can't do it or no, that's not good. I mean, a good example is um, just even teaching the laparoscopy in Mongolia. There's one time I had a very good friend, uh, Dr. Contini, he's uh, from Italy, and he's been involved in global surgery work for many years, and invited him to come and teach out in Hovd, Mongolia, way out west. I taught there the year before, got all the equipment there, and when you land there, I had the representative from Storch look out the window and say, oh, looks like you're landing on the moon. He says, oh, Dr. Price, how are we going to teach laparoscopy here? <laughs> I said, just watch. The Mongolians are so smart. They'll figure it out. Um, this guy took there and he, I sent him out there and he worked for two weeks. We got back in the capital city. He said, Ray, thank you for confirming that I don't think we should be doing this teaching here in Mongolia. And I said, okay, explain to me why you don't think we should be doing this. Oh, they don't know how to do sterile technique and they don't know how to put in a chest tube and they don't know how to do this and that. And I said, you're right. So did you teach him? He said, what? I said, laparoscopy was the tool that got you into their hospital, that bought the trust that allows you to go in there and teach many things. Did you take the opportunity to teach? Because all of our programs where we go was not just laparoscopy. We included emergency and essential surgical care. Initially, it was combined very heavily with the WHO and all of our projects, bringing in people from multiple areas. And so there's one place we went to teach. We couldn't even start teaching laparoscopy. There's a bad, bad accident the day before. We spent the first day putting in new chest tubes and cleaning up uh, the whole accident and taking care of the patients. Um, and so I, we talked for about three hours in the Capitol. And I hadn't realized that 10 months before I came, he published an article why we shouldn't teach laparoscopy in the developing world. <laughs> By the time we left Ulaanbaatar, he finally said, you know, I think I see a little different perspective. But that's even our, in our home institutions where people say, you know, why are you doing this? You know, this is, we've got people here in our own country that need help. Why don't you just stay here and help? And it was very nice to, oh, about two or three years ago, finally have the chairman of the Division of General Surgery at the university come up, who was really not for any of this, come up and say, Ray, I finally understand why this is so important. I just fin finished all my interviews for the new residents coming in and every single one asked about global surgery and how they could be involved with it. And did we have a program here that could do it? Says Ray, I didn't see that vision. So I think, I think you have to be able to be adaptable like Rachel said, you have to be flexible, but you need to be also 
um, a little pushy and, and let people know what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, there's different ways to do it. Different institutions are doing it different ways. And so I can go on a long time about a lot of things that we have not been successful with, but I won't do that right now. Okay. But stick to your guns and know what you believe in. Is what you're saying? Yeah, no, I mean, thank you to both of you for, for sharing that, um, for be, for just like giving us that insight. I think at our stage, it's, it's so easy to get inspired and, and motivated by all of your accomplishments, but it's also very comforting and motivational to hear of the setbacks along the way, because that's very, a very human experience. Um, so Before, just, just one other comment there real quick, is that yeah. people ask, well, how do you get some of these things done? Like you just, you just mentioned uh, to look and see what's been accomplished. Um, I just gave grand rounds uh, called by small and simple things. And, uh, and I showed how the projects we've done shown here's, here's the big success, but how did we get there? And it was really by small and simple things that took years and years of dedicated work by many people. And you can lose sight of that. You can think, oh, I want to go change the world. You guys will all change the world. Where's it? <laughs> oh my gosh, just to see all of these people so excited to, to, to look at these problems, but it's not going to change overnight. And it's going to be by doing little simple things along the way. Sorry, go ahead. No, that was great. Thank you. Thank you for adding that. Um, okay, so I'm going to, let's see, the next question that we had from, uh, and audience members is also to both of you. Um, it, both of you have done significant work, um, both on the field as well as on a systems and educational level with respect to increasing capacity and accessibility um, of surgical care in LMICs. So the question is, what have you found is slash are the greatest challenges um, in pulling for investment in surgical infrastructure from the level of government or international agencies um, such as ministries of health or World Health Organization. Maybe Dr. Price, we'll, we'll start with you to not make Dr. Davis go first each time. <laughs> well, that question just uh, talked about a whole lot of things. Yeah. World Health Organization, uh, you know, USAID, uh, ministries of health, just a, a whole group that all have their different challenges uh and and uh ways that they can help um usaid uh, there's not much wording in there in terms of surgical diseases we've been working on the national level to try to figure out how we get wording into uh you know congress tells usaid how to spend the money so we have to have wording in the documents that come from congress that tells usaid how to spend the money so we need to to, to, to do some of these things of funding in those areas we need to begin to understand how to work within those organizations and, and how to become uh, facile with the, the U.S. government, with international uh, groups uh, from the UN, United Nations. So when we wanted to get the World Health Assembly resolution for, global, uh, for emergency and essential surgical care, there was a friend of mine that called seven years before that happened and said, hey, Ray, we need to get a resolution. And he got a lawyer and he, they wrote up a resolution. We were pretty naive. He says, Ray, you get Mongolia and Ecuador to come on board. He'd get Nigeria. And I can't remember if it was uh, one of the um, European countries. And um, boy, we were very naive to start that. But uh, we, we found out that as we started to push for that, the U.S. said that they would veto it. I couldn't put any more uh, things on the World Health Organization. They didn't have any money. And so then we... We, we lobbied with the American College of Surgeons to write a letter to our representative. We had our Center for Global Surgery invite all the other centers for global surgeries and actually universities to write letters to our representatives. We got the American College of Surgeons on board and they looked at how we do uh, lobbying. We found that there's a 36 member executive body and we used the 45 member of the international governors to approach their leaders if they were in that 36 member body. Um, we eventually found a surgeon, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Macasa, who came to our Global Initiative Emergency Central Surgical Meeting in Trinidad and Tobago. He's from Zambia and he was over the African nations. What we found out is we got the African nations to come on board. It made the U.S. look stupid and they came on board anyway. 
So, um, you know, funding from various organizations, a friend of mine, previous Minister of Health of Ecuador, said, you know, it's good to let the Minister of Health know what you're doing, but if you really want to accomplish something, find a champion who's lower than that. Somebody who's going to be around for a while. I mean, in Mongolia for 16 years, I've probably worked with 20 different Ministers of Health. Uh, we've had a Minister of Finance ask us for a proposal. We gave him a $10 million proposal for Mongolia to take out a loan to build a surgical training center. And then the Ministry of Finance changed. And that's been floundering. Um, so, so there are challenges in all those areas. They're all very specific. So a few examples. All right, thank you. Dr. Davis. I mean, I obviously can't give any any answer more detailed than that. That was really <laughs> <laughs> informative. Um, but I, I will just, as an overview comment, say that yeah. um, it seems that the problems that international organizations and governments face are very similar to the problems that we face in our own departments and our own institutions. And a lot of that comes down to, do we have the will to do this? And do we have the funding to do this? <laughs> And, um, and so I think um, advocacy is really important um, and backing it up with funding sources is also really important um, to accomplishing these things. Now, I think one other comment is, um, and actually maybe I should share as an example, uh, which one's here? Um, did I share that? How do I get to? I want to get to the end of this. There's a slide that I used on a recent Grand Rounds. So we got that resolution passed to the year also the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery came out. Shoot, it's not in this one. Um, I think I chose the wrong one. All right, how do I stop that share? Anyway, the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery came out in 2015. We had the resolution in the World Health Assembly come out that year, and we had the Disease Control Priorities uh, book a chapter come out. Um, all those kind of came at a great, great time, and, and that World Health Assembly resolution gave um, marching orders to countries, and 194 countries voted for it, so that the Harvard group has done very good work in then approaching countries and getting Dr. Uh, Mikasa and others to work with them so that in working on national surgical plans has been a, a real uh, effort from the Harvard group. And I have a, their graph that shows each year over the last three, four years, which countries have been coming on board. Um, so I think there are things that can be done to, you know, when you get a country that comes on and has then developed a national surgical plan and agrees to put finances toward that, you know, hopefully that'll help all of us in the work that we're doing. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I think um, I think we have time for yeah. We'll so we'll have we'll leave time for one more question. This will be the last question uh, for the Q and A portion. Um, so a few of um, our audience members, as medical students, want to know um, from from both of y'all's perspective, um, what is your advice and for how to get more hands-on experience in global surgery as medical students and how can medical students be most useful in the field? Um, I, I think that one thing I'll say is that it's um, probably not a great idea to use low resource settings to um, try to gain your educational experience. Um, but what you can do is um, start by um, being around people that are really experienced who can um, can teach you and in that way get a really good education um, by you know having mentors that are in the field so yeah so i think there's a whole lot of opportunities um, uh, for medical students to participate at a level one is to learn more what it means to be global surgery um, you know, in terms of a career in academic global surgery. Well, there's not a lot of places that really funds you. When you really look at most people doing it, 
they're saying, I want to get a job. And, you know, a friend of mine just said they got a job three quarter time to do clinical work. They're going to do one quarter global surgery. And that means they're funded three quarters of the time. Uh, the grants haven't been great coming. Um, Catherine DeVries, her, her work was half time for global surgery and half time for uh, her clinical work, but the half time for the global surgery was an unfunded mandate. So I think you need to learn. Uh, I hope during your guys' career as you come up that we develop the pathways that provides actually an academic career or not even an academic, a clinical career can be both but pathways that allow people to study and implement solutions uh, to these problems worldwide. Um, and I think there, there are ways to do that. I currently have 15% of time for mo multiple of my faculty members. Uh, we're, we're actually hiring a new uh, uh, assistant director for, and gonna fund 30% of her time. So I think things are changing and I think we need to find ways to do that. As a medical student, um, to, to learn that, uh, get on, read the Lancet Commission in Global Surgery. It's free online. The Disease Control Priorities, third edition, Emergency Central Surgical Care. It's free and online. And to get, like Rachel said, get with some people who are doing it, and there's no reason that you can't participate in some sort of um, uh, literature review of what's going on and be able to publish on it so you understand and begin to get an interest in some area. I have medical students come to me and I have two types. I have one that comes and says, oh my gosh, I want to save the world. I like to do something global surgery. What can I do? I have the other type that calls me and says, I'm very interested in trauma surgery and in business. And I want to combine business and trauma surgery. And am I interested in doing something in Asia? Is there something that I can study? I'm thinking about studying and X, Y, and Z. Now, which student do you think I would be much happier to work with? The second one. And that's what happened with a uh, medical student from Dartmouth who called, he was already in Vietnam working on a project. And uh, we had, I said, okay, you've got a business background. Let's study the, uh, how we're gonna make advanced trauma life support affordable in low income countries. And he worked hard on that. We've got an article published now, it's out there. Um, so I think it's important from a medical student standpoint, get in some groups. We have a global surgery student group at our university. Uh, they get together and they have speakers come and talk. Um, and they come and they can do little uh, internships with us to work with us on projects. Um, but the thought about, you know, if you wanna to go to another spot in, in, in the world, there are places and groups you can go with that can help you refine what you want to do. Um, so anyway, those would be my thoughts. Hey, sounds good. Thank you. You know, dedicating your uh, Tuesday night to watching a global surgery webinar isn't a bad, bad idea either. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so that's um, all for the Q&A portion. Thank you so much. To, um, to both of you, Dr. Price and Dr. Davis, for your time. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, for all of the participants, just, um, just a quick um, overview or like review of resources um, to kind of, for like further, if you wanted to look it up, to t that touched on some of the things we talked about. Um, so the GSSA database is a great uh, resource that can be found on the GSSA website. Um, and it is um, a wonderful opportunity um, to foster collaboration, partnership, mentorship, especially um, to connect mentees and mentors and um, kind of like what Dr. Um, Dr. Davis was saying, um, to, can, to find like a mentor and you, and you can really like zero in on, on a region or a particular project that you're passionate about, like the example that Dr. Price gave. Um, so it's a really great resource to use um, to, to try to find that mentor and to, 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 to learn more about the field um, and for anyone who's interested. Um, and then um, I also would like to just make the announcement that um, the uh, national team um, applications for GSSA will be going out in November. Um, and that also gives an opportunity to work with fellow students um, in advocacy and, and learning more and engaging in global surgery on the medical student and beyond the level. 
Um, and yes, and then the last announcement will just be keep an eye out um, on the list there for future webinars and um, also keep an eye out for the email I'll be sending out in a little bit for um, your feedback for everybody who attended. We really value your feedback. We, um, we really look forward to hearing your thoughts and, and want to continue to uh, improve this initiative. We're very excited about it and I'm so happy um, that everybody was able to make it tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night.